Um, I'd like to just uh, now introduce uh, uh, Bert Hoffman, who will be moderating uh, the first session this morning. Bert. Thank you very much, Michelle. Thank you, Murray, and thank you, Hans Orlov, for a great tribute. It's my privilege to indeed uh, moderate this first of two sessions on the life and works of Dimitrios Tychopoulos, um, the scientific career. And I ask Pagona, Pagona Lagu, to give the first talk. Pagona is Professor of Hygiene and Epidemiology at the University of Athens Medical School. She's, of course, a junk professor here at the Harvard Chen School and a very long-term and deep collaborator of Dimitrios Pagona. Thank you very much, Bert. Good morning. Please allow me to start by thanking the chair of the epidemiology department, Michelle Williams, and her team for arranging this symposium in honor of Dimitrios. It is a huge privilege for me to have the opportunity today on this occasion to be among people Dimitrios respected, admired, and felt very close to. Sina, do I just? Okay, here I am. When Dimitrios was teaching at the Cancer Epic course at HSPH, he always preferred to address two cancer sites primary liver cancer and breast cancer. And the first contrast that you would point to the students was that for primary liver cancer and lung cancer, much less has been spent and much more has been accomplished in terms of identification of strong risk factors, whereas the opposite was true for breast cancer. Dimitrios worked on lung and uh, liver cancer because these were common cancers in Greece on account of our very poor smoking habits and the high prevalence of chronic hepatitis infections at that time. But breast cancer was his pet project. And Greece, with its existing or non-existing infrastructure, was the least suitable place for him to study his hypothesis. Now, what was this hypothesis? In 1990, Dimitrios published a paper in The Lancet claiming that increased concentrations of estrogens and possibly other hormones during pregnancy increase the probability of daughters getting breast cancer by creating a fertile soil for subsequent cancer initiation. The assumptions were that factors which increase the risk of cancer when they act in adult life may also increase it when they act in utero, a period in life when we have more immature cells. And also estrogens, hormones that had been implicated in breast cancer etiology in adult life, were, if anything, 10 times higher in concentration during pregnancy than in other periods of adult life. In 1995, in an editorial Dimitrios wrote about early life influences and cancer in general, he was saying, a simple hypothesis is that pregnancy steroids or other hormones, such as insulin like growth factor 1, are positively associated with the total number of stem cells. And why would that apply to breast cancer, perhaps even more than other cancers? Because of the very nature of the mammary tissue. The mammary tissue is the only organ which is not fully differentiated at birth. It undergoes maximum development during pregnancy and lactation and regresses after menopause. We know that breast cancer occurs rather late in life, mostly after menopause. The idea that the crucial period for the operation of breast cancers may lie even earlier was not a new one. Already in a paper in The Lancet in 1969, Philip Cole and Brian McMahon have pointed to the years around menarche as crucial years for breast cancer etiology. That same year, Dimitrios, in a case control study in Greece, showed that adult height is positively associated with breast cancer risk, the adult height being used as a proxy for the rate of growth early in life. This time, Dimitrios was taking it even earlier, in utero. 
An interesting hypothesis. An interesting hypothesis with a big challenge for epidemiologists, and the challenge was the huge latency time, decades from the exposure to the outcome. Ideally, one would have wanted a cohort of women followed from before birth to after menopause with all relevant variables recorded and biological samples available. But as you know, life is never that easy. So there had to be ways around this problem. And the ways would be either exploitment of natural experiment or ecological contrast for that matter, or use of registries where relevant variables had been recorded, or even try to find some proxies of the exposure and the outcome who would help shorten this long latency from exposure to outcome. And there was such an unfortunate natural experiment from the 1940s to the 1960s Obstetricians in the U.S. used to prescribe a synthetic estrogen, diethyl silvestrol, or DES, which was supposedly protecting against spontaneous abortions. They soon realized that uh, girls exposed in utero to DES were at much higher risk of cancer of the vagina and the cervix. So a cohort of women exposed to DES has been followed by the NCI, and compared to a cohort of women non-exposed to this synthetic estrogen. And it was found that in adult life, the risk of breast cancer among women exposed in utero to this synthetic estrogen is higher than that among women not exposed to it. Since the 1990 paper, there have been several studies linking birth size as a proxy of in utero exposures to breast cancer risk. Several of these studies were initiated by Dimitrios, others by colleagues in Sweden, and there were also independent studies. So much so that now we consider the positive association of birth weight with breast cancer risk as a more or less established one. In 2004, Dimitrios received an innovator award to study his hypothesis on early life processes, endocrine mediators, and number of susceptible cells in relation to breast cancer risk. He joined forces with colleagues in the US and in Sweden. I can mention here Chong Xie, Hans Olof Adami, Anders Sekbom, and several others. And he created a project comprising five component projects. Three of them yielded from data recorded in registries in Sweden. So the first one looked at postnatal growth in relation to breast cancer risk. The second one studied the association of birth size with adult mammographic density. And the third one looked at whether birth weight interacts with SNPs associated with high risk, higher risk of breast cancer with respect to the risk of this cancer. The fourth component project used two cohorts of pregnant women, one in Shanghai, China, and the other one in Boston, US, and compared cord blood hormone levels in these two cohorts. And the fifth one, led by Chang Xie, looked at the role of stem cells in breast cancer etiology. So for the first component project, we know that babies tend to lose weight before start gaining weight. And we know that weight loss corresponds to water loss, which reflects water retention during pregnancy. And the hypothesis is that higher hormone levels in utero cause higher water retention. And after birth, when they start getting weight, it has been shown that weight gain is associated with the levels, positively associated with the levels of growth hormone like IGF-1. So what we were able to see here is that the bigger the weight loss at the beginning and the higher the rate of weight gain afterwards, the higher the risk of breast cancer in adult life. When we looked at birth weight in relation to mammographic density in adult life, we saw that this mammographic density increases with increasing birth weight. And we know that higher mammographic density is associated with higher risk of breast cancer. For the third component project, we used data from GWA studies available then and identified the top hits in high-risk SNPs in low-penetrance genes. 
And we were able to see, as was reported in these GWA studies, that women in our group who were, who were homogenous in the high-risk allele were at higher risk of breast cancer, and that this risk increased even more with increasing birth weight. For the fourth component project, we built on the striking ecological contrast in breast cancer incidence between Asian and Caucasian women. We know that breast cancer risk is three to fourfold times higher among Caucasian than among Asian women. So we had these two cohorts of pregnant women. We measured cold blood hormone levels, and if anything, we saw that steroid levels were higher among low-risk Asian women than among Caucasian. But we also saw that uh, the sex hormone binding globally, the endocrine compound which binds estrogens and limits their bioactivity, is higher among Asian women. And we found out that a strong growth factor, IGF-1, is higher among Caucasian women. For the fifth component project, Chang Xie was able to show that levels of putative mammary tissue-specific stem cells are correlated with hematopoietic stem cells. And this was important because hematopoietic stem cells are much easier to measure in cord blood than putative mammary tissue-specific stem cells. And we also saw that levels of hematopoietic stem cells increase with increasing birth weight. So in summary, the Innovator project provided evidence that immediate postnatal growth is positively associated with adult breast cancer risk, birth weight is positively associated with adult mammographic density, birth weight could interact with high, with high susceptibility SNPs with respect to adult breast cancer risk, Cord blood SHBG, which is higher in Chinese, and IGF-1, which is higher in Caucasian, could be implicated in breast cancer risk. And hematopoietic stem cell levels, which are positively correlated with levels of putative breast stem cells, are positively also associated with birth weight. Based on the results from the innovator and the existing evidence in the international literature in 2008, uh, under the guidance of Dimitrios, we wrote a mini-review, a mini-review on the etiology of breast cancer, which mentioned three postulates. First, that breast cancer risk depends on the number of mammary tissue-specific stem cells, which is determined early in life, including the intrauterine life. In early and later life, growth-enhancing hormones affect the replication rate of mammary tissue-specific stem cells, the likelihood of spontaneous mutations in these cells and the rate of expansion of initiated clones. And finally, while a pregnancy stimulates replication of already initiating, initiated cells, it conveys long-term protection through differentiation of a large fraction of the mammary tissue-specific stem cells. These three postulates were not independent, but they were all stages in a single biological process. The first one focusing on the perinatal period where tissue-specific stem cells are generated. The second one concentrating on growth factors that, mod that modulate the number of, risk of cells at risk and the growth of mutated clones. And the third one predicting how cells at risk are removed through terminal differentiation or related processes. To make a long story short, it appears that breast cancer etiology is a lifelong journey. There are factors which operate in adult life, but there are also factors which operate very early, even in utero. The interest on the early life origins of cancer in general can also be viewed in one of the latest calls of NCI, the one focusing on early life influences and cancer. Dimitrios was convinced that the answer for breast cancer etiology lied in the number of putative mammary tissue-specific stem cells. He was convinced that the work that was coordinated by Chang Xie was original and promising for the future. And with this, I'm ready to pass the baton to Chang for him to share with us the results of his research. Thank you very much. <laughs>